Welcome to the book club. My name is Joseph Hoffman and I'm the moderator of the History Book Club that meets at the Learned Owl Bookshop here in Hudson. And uh, recently we had a discussion of the Titanic, which was our best discussion with the most people showing up to the event. And today we have two authors from Northeastern Ohio visiting us who have written books on the Titanic. Uh, Mary Ann Whitley and Tad Fitch. And uh, I'm glad to have you here today. Thank you. Um, Mary Ann has spent five years doing research uh, about her family, including her grandfather, who actually helped build the Titanic. Uh, in the process, she uh, made three trips to Belfast. Um, and the result of her uh, research has been that she has co-written a book called Ohio Tales of the Titanic. Tad Fitch has written, uh, along with some other authors, three books. Um, on a Sea of Glass is one about the Titanic, and also the SS Titanic. It's a report into the uh, loss of the SS Titanic. It's actually the full title. He's also written a book on World War I ship sinkings called Into the Danger Zone. And thank you, both of you, for coming here today and taking time out of your busy lives. Uh, and I think we should uh, start with Mary Ann. Mary can you tell okay. us a little bit about how you got involved with the Titanic? Right, yeah. My involvement, I guess, really could be traced to the James Cameron film in 1997 because I always felt that if it weren't for that, I probably wouldn't, would never have met my co-author. Um, I always did have a casual interest in the Titanic because of the story that you mentioned of my grandfather uh, helping to build the ship in Belfast, uh, Ireland. And I heard the story when I was growing up in uh, Flint, Michigan about how my grandfather knew this guy named Archie Frost who was on the ship and went down with the ship. And um, my grandfather supposedly had plans to come over on the maiden voyage but changed his mind. He was planning to come over here and work and bring the family over later. And um, then in, in 97 when the film was coming out there was all this hype surrounding it and there were a lot of websites springing up and I started to wonder if I could really document this family story. So I ultimately discovered that um, Archie Frost, the guy that my grandfather knew, was one of Thomas Andrews, the designer, ship designers, um, group of a troubleshooting team, which was called the Guarantee Group. And those men were they sort of on board the ship to make sure all the systems were functioning properly. And he, uh, all of them, in fact, went down with the ship. So I did all this research, I found cousins in Belfast, U.S., Canada, and so on, and eventually even met Archie Frost's granddaughter. But um, that sort of leads into how the book project came about. Also because of the James Cameron movie, I um, was writing a piece for The Plain Dealer where I work as a copy editor about this quest I had to find out more about Archie Frost and my grandfather. And after that was published, I heard from a a guy in um, North Olmsted named Chuck Otter, and his great-grandfather, Richard Otter, had gone down with the ship. So I was really fascinated to find that there were all these connections to Cleveland. And um, he invited me to a program in Parma about the Titanic where he was speaking, and that was where I met uh, my co-author. And there were some other descendants of Ohio-bound passengers there, and. That's where I really became fascinated with this whole idea that there were a lot of Ohio connections. And I started sending Janet a lot of information. And eventually, she, I kept telling her that she should write a book. Eventually, she asked me if I would help her with it. So that's how that all came about. And, you know, I think with a lot of people, when they get interested in the Titanic, they find out, like, it sucks you in. There's no turning back. And, and um, that's kind of how it grabbed hold of me and how this whole thing came about, so. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm kind of curious. Um, uh -huh. What are the statistics for how many people were on the ship or involved in the Titanic uh, who were living in Ohio? Yeah, you know, a lot of people are surprised to find out that there were actually 55 people on board who were traveling to Ohio. And um, of those people, 28 of them died and 27 survived, so it was about half and half. And 
actually the majority of those people were coming to Northeast Ohio. Like 16 were coming to Cleveland and Northeast Ohio and 12 were going to Akron. 16 to Youngstown and then the rest of the people coming to Ohio were scattered about other parts of the state like Toledo and Columbus. Now it seems like the people that were coming over were coming over for different reasons. Is there a way to categorize the different groups of people and why they were coming over? Yeah, there were really like three primary reasons why people were traveling to Ohio at that time. They were either immigrating here for jobs and a new life or they were visiting friends and relatives in the United States or they were coming back from trips overseas. And the immigrants were coming here because Northeast Ohio had a lot of manufacturing at that time. They had uh, steel and iron, auto manufacturing, quarries, paint manufacturing and the shipping ports. So all those factors were uh, entered into why a lot of immigrants were coming to the Cleveland, Northeast Ohio area. Now with all your research, mm -hmm. have you discovered some interesting stories about some of the people who live locally in our area? Yeah, in fact, um, since this is the Hudson uh, TV station, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the couple of the families who are traveling to this part of the state. They were coming to Summit County to Akron. and. Um, the first of those people is uh, Addie Wells and her children, Ralph, uh, age two, and Joan, age four, which I brought a picture of here. Um, they actually never intended to sail on the Titanic. They had planned to travel on the Oceanic when they left their home in Cornwall, England. And she was joining her husband, Arthur, who was already in Akron, and he was working in the rubber industry. But there was a coal strike in England at the time, and that canceled the Oceanic's voyage. So the Wells family was actually put on the Titanic and, um, and they were second class passengers. So on the night of April 14th, Addie was just about to fall asleep in her cabin when she, she felt a jar and the children uh, who were with her, they didn't even wake up, it was a very slight jar. So eventually though, she was summoned to go up on deck and she got the children ready and they were all put into a lifeboat. Well, when, when this lifeboat um, reached the surface of the ocean, it started to drift under another lifeboat that was also being lowered. So passengers were shouting to the crew up on the deck to stop lowering that boat, and it came very close to crashing down on top of them. Wow. So um, someone in Addie's boat finally cut the ropes and they were able to row it away. Now, if you saw the James Cameron film, you may remember that this incident actually was depicted in the movie. And then uh, I can add that uh, fortunately Addie and her and her children survived the ordeal and they eventually reached Akron as planned. But um, the, the tragedy with this family is that, um, and this is from the Akron Beacon Journal, they did a, a front page article about it. When Joan Wells was uh, 25, and this is you know after surviving the Titanic, she was, she was engaged to William Lockman, who was a high school teacher. And he was on a fishing trip in Canada when she became ill and she had these operations, but she ended up dying of sepsis, which is a blood infection. And they had tried frantically to reach him, but he was in this remote area of Canada and they couldn't get a hold of him. And so sadly, he was unable to return home till after she had already died. So you can see that, you know, even after the Titanic, some of these families were stalked by tragedy. And there actually are still descendants of the Wells family living in, in uh, Akron today. Mm -hmm. And then another um, family who was heading to Akron, also from Cornwall, England, was the uh, Hocking and Richards family. And this is uh, Emily Richards and her children. Uh, Elizabeth Hocking had been widowed twice when she had decided to immigrate to America to, uh, to join her sons, Sidney and George. They were already here working, and um, George had gone back to Cornwall to bring his mother and his aunt, Mrs. Ellen Wilkes, and his sisters, Nellie Hocking and, and Emily Richards and her children. So Emily's husband also was, was here in Akron and was, was working here. So she had planned to join him here, obviously. The, um, the group were traveling as second class passengers, except Mrs. Wilkes, who was in third class. And the women, uh, after the collision, they didn't have time to get dressed. They only had their nightgowns on under their coats. and. They fortunately all made it, up, made it up on the upper decks and were put in lifeboats. But George died in the disaster, and he, along with his two friends with whom he was sharing a cabin, they also were traveling to Akron. Uh, 
to continue the, uh, the sort of tale of these, these tragedies happening to these families afterwards, uh, Elizabeth Hawking, who was the one who had immigrated here to be with her sons, she ended up dying tragically only two years after the disaster. And it, it's a very strange coincidence. I don't know if you'll be able to see on this um, copy of the Akron Beacon Journal, but there's a story at the top of the page that says, woman uh, saved from Titanic killed here. And what happened with her was she was injured in a streetcar accident when she was going to visit her daughter, Emily Richards. And this accident happened on, on uh, April 14th, which of course is the same day the Titanic hit the iceberg. And then she died early on the morning of April 15th, just like the Titanic sank. On That's early. quite ironic. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's one of those very strange stories. And then also, Ellen Wilkes, who was Elizabeth's sister, she also died, died tragically. Um, in 1955, she was found to be living as a recluse in this house without water or heat. And um, it's not known, you know, what the reasons were, except that we can only surmise that, you know, she was suffering from some form of dementia and had, you know, lost the ability to take care of herself. She ended up suffering severe frostbite and having to have her feet partially amputated, mm. and, and she died two months later. Mm. So. Well, in your talk you're, um, about a couple of these families, the Wells mm -hmm. family, you mentioned that the coal strike had um, resulted in them taking the Titanic instead of a different ship. Right. And I was just curious, did what impacted the Wells family also impact other people who were on that ship? And, and Tad can chime in on this, too. Yeah, yeah, in fact, it did. And I, I might add that the shipping companies, including the White Star Line, they were all affected since coal was their fuel and they were... Um, you know, that they used to travel. So the, even though the strike was settled on April 6th, and, but there still wasn't enough coal to fuel the t Titanic's uh, bunkers for the April 10th maiden voyage to America. So since it was her maiden voyage, the, other, um, the coal that was meant for the other White Star Line ships, the Oceanic and the Majestic, and also four other ships from the American line, all that coal was diverted to the Titanic. So some passengers were booked on these vessels whose crossings were canceled because of this coal strike. And they discovered that they'd been transferred to the Titanic. Now, some people were very happy about that. You know, they were suddenly going to get a chance to sail on this wonderful new ship. You know, um, so, but besides the Wells family, the, and, and actually the Richards and Hawking family also, there were a couple of other um, Ohio bound passengers who ended up being transferred to the Titanic. They were uh, Mary uh, Corey and Claire Carnes. They were making a stop in Cleveland before going on to Pittsburgh. And also Henry Mitchell, who was traveling to Toledo. They had all originally purchased tickets on the liner in the Philadelphia. Wow. Yeah, the coal strike is really kind of a tragic thing when you look at the Titanic story, because there was a number of people that would have had nothing to do with Titanic at right. all. Um, they were booked on other vessels. Uh, and you have to figure, too, with the strike just ending and there not being coal available for a lot of these other ships to sail, you had an abundance of crew members who were wanting to sign on to Titanic to get some work. Uh, and that's really a sad thing because there was a large number of them that didn't end up making it because of that. If they had stayed in port and been laid up off work for a little bit longer, they would have been fine. Uh, a good example of this is uh, a guy who was the assistant saloon steward, uh, Walter Nichols, his name was. Uh, he transferred from the St. Paul, which is one of the vessels that didn't sail because of having a lack of coal. And there's about 20 other crew members that he knew personally that transferred along with him. And he believed he was the only survivor out of wow. that group. Mm -hmm. um, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. And um, other examples, like people, in, in hindsight, this is almost a very ironic thing. They were happy to go on this. It was a brand new vessel. They were traveling on some ships that weren't quite as new and state of the art. Um, an example of that second class passenger, Sidney Collette, who was a reverend, he had tried to book mm. on, on two separate vessels before oh, this. Really? And mm -hmm. was very frustrated that he could not get a spot. Um, so he transferred on Titanic and went through this ordeal. And he was one of the lucky ones that survived. Um, one of the more tragic examples, there's two brothers who were carpenters, Edgar and Frederick Giles. Mm. They ended up transferring over, they're supposed to go on the Oceanic, which you just mentioned mm. a minute ago. And they both transferred aboard Titanic, and during the sinking, they both didn't make it. Uh, so it's like a twist of fate that they were not 
really supposed to be on this vessel, and then you had all these people that moved in from other places and then ended up in a terrible situation. Uh, mm -hmm. Was there um, a story about a, um, a group of guys who imbibed too much the night before, <laughs> and then they end up oversleeping and missing, yes. missing the boat? <laughs> I believe those were um, firemen, which oh, most people okay. call stokers, and they were having a last <laughs> pint or two at the bar, um, and they headed out a little bit too late, and they had withdrawn the gang planks, and mm. the crew members, the officers were like, well, it's too late for you, you have to stay. <laughs> And they were lucky. They didn't yeah. know how fortunate I, they were. I don't think they were happy when it happened, but after right. the fact, <laughs> right. certainly. <laughs> uh, well, Marianne, were there um, other stories that might be more tied into, sort of, we're talking about fate here a little bit, uh, that mm -hmm. were tied into fate or maybe some kind of supernatural element that you might have to share? Right, yeah. Actually, there are quite a few stories of coincidence and premonitions involving the Titanic. And actually one of those involves a person from your area here, and that was John C. Middleton, uh, who was vice president of the uh, Canton Akron Ra Railway, which was an electric transit company. And this is a, um, you know, an article that appeared in the Cleveland Plain Dealer about him having this dream. He was in London, England, and he had he said that he had these troubling dreams, and he had told his wife about this, and he had also told several friends about the dreams, like 10 days before the tragedy. And various of these people actually vouched for this, and, and one of them actually signed, had a signed affidavit saying that he actually told them this before the Titanic sank. At any rate, Milton's story uh, appeared in The Plain Dealer on April 18, 1912, and uh, here is how he described it. He said, I booked a cabin on the Titanic on March 23rd. I felt depressed at the time, and on April 3rd, I dreamt I saw the Titanic capsized in mid-ocean and a lot of passengers struggling in the water. The following night, I had the same dream. So the next day, I told my wife and several friends, and on receiving a cable from America that business did not necessitate my crossing, I decided to cancel the passage. So... There you go. There's a, a, a local person here who had a premonition and didn't get on board and, and lived to tell about it. <laughs> listen, listen to his premonition. Right. And it was a worthwhile thing to listen right. to. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share? Well, there is one other little small story, a small connection to the Canton area uh, that involves the Titanic. There was a man named Marcellus Roosh who uh, wrote and self-published several songs. He was... Um, a composer, a teacher, a choir director, and vocalist, and he actually sang at the uh, funeral of uh, assassinated President William McKinley, who, as mm. I'm sure most people know, is buried in Canton. Anyway, he wrote that little song called The Sinking Titanic. <laughs> that was very inter yeah. interesting. Thank you, Marianne. Um, Ty, would you like to share a little bit of how you uh, became involved in researching the Titanic and all the stories surrounding it? Certainly, I'd be glad to. Now, th this is something that started, I'm interested in history in general. Um, if you go back at uh, our family history, my father's actually into writing and research. And he's into more sports and boxing and has published multiple oh. books on that. Oh. So it's kind of like a family thing. Okay. My oldest brothers and I kind of shared that growing up with him as an interest. Uh, it goes back, mine's kind of a little bit mundane, but we were on vacation in Virginia Beach, and we were at an all-you-can-eat seafood restaurant, if you can go figure. <laughs> and um, they had a model of the Lusitania and Titanic. This oh. is um, just before the wreck was discovered. Oh, interesting. Uh, of course, being a little kid, I was fascinated by that and wanted to know what they were. And my dad had told me, oh, they're ships that sank in the Atlantic. So being a kid, I was like, oh, I thought they meant like right offshore from where the beach was, and I thought that was really interesting. My dad was quick to correct me, no, not right <laughs> off the beach. Uh, and he told me a little bit about the story. So I got interested, and then very shortly after that, they found the, the wreck. Uh, Dr. Ballard's expedition with the French found that. And uh, from that point on, I was fascinated, read just about everything that I could find on the subject, and eventually started researching on my own because there was all these questions that I had that weren't answered by published uh, books and, and things like that. So I started doing research in journal, for journals and magazines and had a number of articles published. And shortly before the centennial of the sinking uh, in right. 2012, some of the lines of research I was working on kind of tied in with some things that some of my friends in the research field were doing. And they had asked, would you guys want to write a book, combine our research and write a book? I uh, thought we had some things that were new that we could add to the the body of information. 
uh, and kind of went from there. So uh, it's something that, like Marianne said, once you get interested in this, you keep yes. on finding additional reasons <laughs> to, to keep looking into it. And you think yeah. your interest is going away and then something brings it back. It really is kind of a lifelong fascination. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your, um, your books seem to have a more broader perspective on the Titanic. Um, and I'm just curious, I mean, one of the questions that I always hear is why or, and how the Titanic sank? And there's a lot of different theories and <laughs> people think they've figured it all out. Uh, with all of the research you've done, is there anything that you, um, any ideas or um, theories that you've come up with that would explain what really may have happened on the Titanic that night? Well, definitely, and I would like to clarify on this. I don't pretend to know everything about the <laughs> sinking, and I think anybody that would claim that is foolish. Like, about any historical event, there's always going to be unknowns. But there, what really is kind of obscured the truth about this is all these weird conspiracy theories over time. Uh, like, they were trying to break the transatlantic uh, crossing record, which is not true because the Titanic wasn't fast enough to, to beat some of the Cunard liners that were in service at the time that went faster. Uh, there seems to be some evidence that it was trying to beat its sister ship's uh, maiden voyage crossing uh, record, but um, that's not really true about the, they were going so fast and that. Uh, I think one of the simplest ways to sum up why the ship sank wasn't because of it was constructed poorly or anything like that. That's something people say sometimes. It really is just because the way that it hit the iceberg, uh, it hit in such a way that it opened up what many more compartments than the safety features were designed to handle if they started flooding. Mm -hmm. uh, so it sounds like a dumb answer, but really what it is, is it sank because it hit the iceberg, not because of poor construction, <laughs> not because of anything like that. Um, it really it was designed for the first four compartments could have been opened up to the sea, and it still would have been able to survive. Uh, Titanic, they, you had flooding in the first five compartments where it was really significant flooding, and then another additional compartment opened up where they were able to keep ahead of it with the pumps and, and damage control for a time, and then they lost it. But really, once that fifth compartment was flooding, the ship was doomed. There's nothing they can do about it. The weight would pull the ship down, the, the water would pull it down, and then eventually the water comes up over the bulkheads and it floods. People use the ice cube tray analogy, which is partially incorrect, but it's a good visual for it, where if you push it down, how the water comes up over the top because the compartments weren't sealed. Uh, okay. Uh, but there really is no evidence that the ship was poorly constructed. People say the rivets were poor. Uh, by today's standards, you look at today's construction materials and what they can do with steel and iron as far as having less impurities in it. Of course, with better technology, it's much better constructed. But for 1912, it was pretty standard, high quality, what they can do with the technology back then. Of course, there's more impurities than modern steel, but that's, they didn't have the technology we right. have now. And um, I think the number one point of evidence that the ship was well constructed was that its sister ship, uh, the RMS Olympic, right was built from the same exact materials as Titanic and was in service all the way through the 1930s without any sort of structural failures or problems. It was in terrible weather, served in World War I, even rammed a U-boat and sank it during the war. And uh, it really, there was never any issues with the construction, which I'm sure would have showed up if it was because of poor uh, building or material. Well, if, um, if the ship was up to standards, mm -hmm. um, do you think there's a is there anybody that should be held accountable for what happened? I mean, there's the captain, um, the crew, the, the liner company itself. Um, do, you, do you have any thoughts about uh, if there's a blame that needs to be placed on anybody or any particular parties involved? Well, I think one of the natural human reactions to any disaster is to seek out a scapegoat or something that you can tangibly look at and blame for why this happened, because it's a horrible thing. Uh, people often they look at the story and they're like, well, they knew there was ice ahead. They'd received uh, warnings from other ships. Uh, they knew on the chart and, and on the bridge that there was ice in the general vicinity of where they were going to be going, so that wasn't a surprise. So a lot of people say, well, why are they still steaming full ahead, full speed ahead into an ice field like that, and isn't that negligent? And uh, you look at, from our standpoint after the fact, certainly it looks like that, mm -hmm. but really, it, by standard operating procedure for passenger liners back in 1912, um, it really was not the standard to slow down unless there was poor visibility mm -hmm. or poor conditions. Mm -hmm. And the night the ship hit the iceberg was perfectly uh, calm, like no waves at all. It was clear visibility. Uh, they thought that they'd be able to see any ice or any problems and steer around or be able to slow down if there became a problem. 
so really what they were doing is pretty much the same as any other captain on a passenger liner would do, but mm -hmm. people like to, to blame Captain Smith or the other crew members for saying, isn't that stupid that they were going so fast? But uh, in hindsight, yes, it does seem that way, but by 1912 standards, they were doing the same thing as everybody else. So I, I don't think it's fair to, to label them as scapegoats or say they were doing something incompetent when they were doing what everybody else in that same job would have done at that point. Okay, what, what about, the, there were other ships in the area, and the Californian, I believe mm -hmm. it was, was close enough that people could see its lights from the Titanic, and yet it didn't respond, and I, I, I think there was uh, an inquiry done maybe by the, I don't know if it was by the U.S. Senate, but I think somebody mm -hmm. looked into it to see if they were negligent for not responding. Do you have anything to say about that aspect of it? Um, well, this is a, a minefield of a subject for people that in the research community, it's a very- Hotly debated. Hotly debated, <laughs> and it's almost like, I've always found it fascinating that people get as emotionally worked up about this particular subject as they right. do. Uh, looking at it objectively, like California, there's a debate whether it was like somewhere around 10 or 11 miles away, or if it was more like 20 some miles, and that's really where the debate lays. But I think you can summarize that whole argument down to the point that it, there's no debate at all. It saw Titanic's rockets. Some people say, well, maybe there was another ship in between. Maybe not. Um, but really, this is the, the whole point of why people blame, uh, blame them during the inquiries, is that they, it looked like this ship basically did nothing. They saw right. the rockets. They didn't wake up the wireless operator. They only had one. And he couldn't be on duty 24-7. He needed sleep. So he happened to be asleep at the time. None of the officers on watch woke him up to see what was going on. Um, they mentioned it to the captain who was also asleep, but they didn't really make sure that he got up to investigate. Uh, so a lot of people blame them saying, well, they're in visual range or at least visual range of the rockets. They could have came in and rescued everyone. Uh, so it was, they made an easy scapegoat after the fact. Uh, I think it was a mistake that they didn't investigate further and attempt to do something. But if you look at best case scenario that night when the ship was sinking, and even if they had gotten up the wireless operator right away, uh, got the ship up to steam, and they were mixed in with some ice, just like where, where Titanic was sailing to. There were some icebergs and some um, ice flows and things like that that they would have had to navigate around to get to Titanic. I think under the best case scenario, they would have been able to get there right before the ship sank. Mm -hmm. And that's even if you take best case. So they could have saved some people, but it's kind of a misnomer that they were responsible for all those people dying. Uh, again, it's a tragic mistake that they didn't do, take more action, but they, I don't think they should have been blamed for this loss of life and, and their captain after the fact, um, I think why he's become kind of like the quote unquote villain of the story is because when they got to Boston, the, the Californian arrived in Boston after the fact and they denied that they even had seen the rockets and then it got out in the paper. And I think that was a big mistake to cover it up after the fact, but really it's not like they were sitting there knowing the ship was sinking and, and didn't do anything intentionally. It was just a tragedy of errors that led to them not taking further action and what it's really not fair from a historical standpoint to blame them for all these people dying when they were completely separate and it was just a number of things that went wrong that lit, like led to them not taking further action. Yeah. So it's just like a, a web of circumstances, unfortunate mm -hmm. circumstances right. that led to the tragedy basically. Exactly, yeah. Isn't there a lot of debate today too about that there may have been other ships That's one also of the in the area? They keep bringing up new evidence that there were other ships in the mm -hmm. area. Where do they find evidence about other ships? Is there records, uh, shipping records that they find that place a ship in a particular place at that time? Is that how it works? Well, I, I think part of it is that there's been a number of books on the subject over the years. And so there's some theories that stand up closer to scrutiny than others. But there really has never been anybody that's been proven to be on the scene besides those two ships. But The quote mystery ship. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. But I, I think the, what the, the debate boils down to for me is like the ship Nobody debates that it's all the rockets. That the debate is really whether they are in visual of each other, and I think, like I said, it's a misnomer because even if they had made an attempt, they wouldn't have been able to rescue everybody. But I guess we wouldn't be sitting here talking about if they had right. tried. They would have been the first ship on the scene, regardless. It wouldn't have been the Carpathia, which actually came to the rescue. So mm -hmm. Captain Lord would have ended up being the hero instead of the goat in the story. Scapegoat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so very controversial subject, but. Well, also in. Uh, in the aftermath of the Titanic, um, it seems that there would be a, a, a big reaction as far as safety standards mm -hmm. that would have changed. Um, 
And also I'm going to tie this into your, your latest book, Into the Danger Zone, mm -hmm. where there was a series, well, uh, you can tell me how many sinkings there were during yeah. World War I. Yeah. But were, were ships equipped diff differently or more adequately than they were before? And were, was all that directly related to the Titanic? Uh, I think the large chunk of the safety feature changes that we're accustomed to today can be directly traced to Titanic, which is pretty ironic considering it's uh, 100 years later now. But right. uh, Bruce Ismay, who is the chairman of White Star Line, um, very controversial figure because he survived and got off the ship at the last minute. And people blamed him, which I never really understood. It's, there's no evidence he pushed in ahead of other people. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like, I don't know what would have been accomplished if he had died instead of living. But he's kind of become this villainous figure in movies and in stories because of that. But one of the first things he did when the rescue vessel reached New York was he ordered the White Star Line vessels even before any sort of legal action or laws were changed to um, start, none of them would leave port without enough lifeboats. So they started putting rafts and all the other boats onto these other vessels so that they wouldn't leave port without enough lifeboats for all. So that, it, well quickly, as far as you can get in a bureaucracy or governmental changes, back, it was slow back then just like it is now, but they didn't make it eventually where everybody had to have lifeboats for all. And you had to do lifeboat drills, mandatory, like. Back then, some, sometimes they'd do them, sometimes they wouldn't. People wouldn't know where to go always when it was time to evacuate. Now you go on a cruise vessel, and that's one of the right. first things you do. They make you put on the vest and go to your gathering place, and, and you know exactly where to go in the emergency, in theory. 24-hour uh, wireless, we were talking about the California a moment ago. That was a, a big topic because a lot of the ocean liners did have rotations where they had wireless going 24-7, but smaller vessels didn't have a wireless man on duty 24-7, which to, by minor standards seems crazy, but they just didn't have enough people that were in the field or they had employed to do that. So they made that where it was 24-7 wireless. Uh, the actual construction of the ships they made were, they used to have like double bottoms on the bottom part of the ship. So if it got punctured, there was an inner skin where it would in theory prevent grounding accidents from causing flooding. But they put that where it goes up over the side because Titanic and vessels around that time didn't have it extend up over the side of the vessel. Mm -hmm. So when it hit the iceberg, it punctured it, and that's why it started flooding. If it had had an inner layer, it probably wouldn't have happened. Um, compartments in the boats um, were only divided like from one side of the ship to the other, like, um, and they didn't have any compartments that divided down the middle. So if you flooded, it would flood the whole width of the ship and not just one half of it. So that was changed. A lot of vessels went back into port and were retrofitted to meet those new requirements. International Ice Patrol uh, was established, and that really, they track ice flows and icebergs, and there's never been a disaster of this magnitude relating to ice or any significant loss uh, due to ice since that time. Uh, the second part of this is like how this ties into World War I. And uh, a lot of people don't realize, um, Germany during World War I had U-boats that were very advanced, uh, very ahead of their time in a lot of ways. Like By the end of World War I, the submarines they had were equally as advanced as what they were at the start of World War II almost. So they were pretty ahead of their times. So they ended up sinking 5,000 ships and killed about 15,000 people during the war on merchant vessels. Wow. Uh, didn't realize that. Yeah, which is more than World War II. But these vessels, if they didn't have lifeboats for all, if they didn't have the ability to call for help right away when they were torpedoed, sometimes the ships, they'd, they'd flood and then the power generation would end. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have somebody on duty to start calling for help right away when the ship was being attacked, power goes out, nobody knows they need help unless they're in a convoy, you've had greater loss of life. Uh, the number of uh, lifeboats and rafts saved a lot of lives. Now certainly there's cases like Lusitania which sank in a very short period of time, you're talking about minutes rather than hours like Titanic, but a lot of these vessels having boats for all allowed a lot more people to survive than they would have. And although there was um, the British Board of Trade which controlled these safety regulations, Prior to, to Titanic, they were already talking about making some changes to, for greater safety, but who knows how fast that would have gone. World War I started only in 1914, a couple of years after Titanic sank. If these weren't in place by the time the war started, you might have had even more casualties. I mean, true. 15,000 people is a lot of people, but without Titanic, that could have been far worse than that. Yeah, how many ships was it again that? that 5,000 merchant vessels. 5,000 yeah. merchant vessels. Wow. Imagine what the bomb of the Atlantic looks like between that and World War II. Yeah, <laughs> right. Now Lusitania is still, have they dived down to that? Mm -hmm. Have they reached that ship? Have they determined how 
that song, because I know that's another little mystery. Yeah, yeah that, and that's interesting because Lusitania was one of the Cunard Lines vessels, and it was a real speedy ship. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. they had the, that and its sister ship had the record for a while, the Blue Ribbon, they call it. And um, during World War I, it, when it was hit by a torpedo, it penetrated the ship in such a way that it flooded more so on the one side of the vessel than the other, and, and it sank. I forget if it was like 18 minutes or something really short like yeah, that. Right. Uh, so the, even though the vessel had all these safety features that Titanic didn't have, it, it sank with fewer compartments being pierced, just as a fluke the way the damage was done. Uh, that was a case where there was a horrible loss of life, uh, despite all these things that they changed and all that. But I think a lot of the time, uh, it did end up saving people when they had these in place. But it, it, there, a lot of people say there was um, gunpowder and all these munitions oh, and things. Right, right. And, and the vessel, they're very publicly known. Most merchant vessels during that time period were carrying like, like bullets or shell casings or things of that sort. But there, there's no evidence. There's been all types of conspiracy theories that Lusitania was carrying high explosive munitions secretly yeah, and that it blew up right. because of that. But really, there's not any evidence for that. It just seems to be. It just sank. It, it wasn't yeah. a big explosion like a. Well, there, there was a secondary explosion, but it seems to be from the steam lines rupturing rather than from any. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, are there other um, uh, interesting stories about the Titanic that you'd like to share? Uh, yeah, I think one of the things, uh, and this kind of ties together with two of the more famous figures of the sinking, were what happened to Thomas Andrews, who was the shipbuilder, and then also um, Captain Smith. And when I was researching um, with my co-authors for Honesty of Glass, Thomas Andrews, they portray in the movies that he was in the smoking room mm -hmm. and kind of staring off into space and went down with the ship at the last minute. And we found some really um, compelling evidence that, in fact, like he was there at one point during the sinking, but was sighted after the fact by other witnesses and was on the bridge, the front of the ship when, when it went under. Right. And there's actually eyewitness <laughs> accounts saying that he was with Captain Smith shortly before the end. They both went into the water. Uh, and that's very different than what the traditional story has been. Uh, I don't want to go into all the details now because it would take too long <laughs> to, to quote all these uh, eyewitness okay. accounts. But Captain Smith, another one, they always show him as going down with the vessel, going on the bridge. And I think that's because some people, that was the last place they had seen him before they left the vessel. Uh, right. But there is like the wireless operator and a number of other witnesses, it turns out, that saw him jump overboard. Once the top deck of the ship was awash and there was really nothing else that he could do to help out, he did jump overboard. And may have, been, in fact, have been sighted by some people on the water. There's some controversy and you don't know how reliable those statements are, but uh, it seems that he didn't really go down with the ship, but he almost did. <laughs> and then sadly knew that one of them They never survived. found his body. Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. But there are acts of heroism. Uh, I think the band was an example of that, the, mm -hmm. that played to the, right. to well, the end. In the bands, uh, that's the really fascinating thing that is a true legend that it seems like they were playing right up until the last possible minute that they could. And um, all of them perished. None of them survived. Uh, the big controversy is what was their last song. And most, right. most uh, articles and, and movies have shown uh, Near My God to Thee being the song that was played. And there is some evidence for that. Um, the problem is there's like multiple different settings that can be played to. So then you get the question of, well, which version was it? Right. Um, other people mentioned that they heard a song called Autumn. And in modern times, some people have speculated because the wireless operator mentioned that. Some people speculated it was uh, a waltz called Song da Tom. And um, really, I don't think that's correct because there were a number of other witnesses that also mentioned um, a song called Autumn, and they said that old hymn, and there was a hymn called Autumn also. So I think there's evidence for both of those songs being played. Mm -hmm. The question is, what was last? <laughs> and really, from my witness standpoint, it's hard to say because you can compare where people were when they heard it. And right. a lot of people didn't say, well, I heard this precisely five minutes before, or right. I heard this after. Yeah. So you don't know what, at what point they really heard things. But yeah. there is evidence that Near My God's Thee was played, but we don't know that it was the last song. Yeah. And yeah. who was to say that they were going to, you know, they were going to be asked later, what was the last song <laughs> that was played on the Titanic? Exactly. I mean, they weren't. Probably a few more things on their mind yeah. than actually right. exactly. what song they were hearing at that moment in time. Right. I did see the. Um, the violin that was being carried by the band leader was recovered. Mm -hmm. um, 
and was actually auctioned off for quite a bit of money. Now, is, do, you, do you know anything more about that story? Yeah, it was, uh, it was um, recovered with his body, and his body was uh, taken to Halifax, I believe, along with yeah. a lot of the other uh, yeah. victims. And um, it was shipped back to his fiance, and it was kept in the family all those years. And uh, eventually, the family descendants um, revealed that they had this still in their possession. And it was authenticated. It took researchers about seven years, I believe, to authenticate that, that this really was Wallace Hartley's violin. Well, I think it was controversial initially, too, because it was getting towards the centennial, and all of a sudden, this mm -hmm. violin shows up. Well, and it didn't show up right before the anniversary. Like There mm -hmm. was a whole process to authenticate. But they did have a list of the recovered bodies and what their art the articles on, on them were. And for some reason, some of the people they didn't mention everything that was recovered with them. Um, and his didn't mention the violin being recovered, so people were like, ah, see, it's a, it's a fake. But there's contemporary accounts from somebody that was on the recovery vessel and in the papers that there was a case mm. recovered with them that, mm. for whatever reason, didn't make it on that list. But um, some people still debate it, but it does seem to be authentic. I mean, yeah. Going back to the, to the life preservers, the number that were on the ship, um, I'd heard that they, one of the reasons they didn't have as many on there was because, and this is the lifeboats too, actually it's the lifeboats, yeah. um, that they were blocking the view of the passengers so that they weren't able to get a nice view of the ocean. Uh, can you speak to that? Well, that, that was an actual <laughs> quote that's attributed to somebody, and uh, I think it's like kind of a, everybody's kind of latched onto that and it's become a more simplified view of what really happened. But uh, White Star Line, the Dab, the lifeboat davits, so that's the, the arms that were on the deck that lowered the lifeboats over the side. They, when they were designing those ships, they specifically chose that type of uh, davit because they envisioned that the British Board of Trade, which was in charge of the regulations, was going to up the number of lifeboats that were required eventually. Um, ship, ships have been really expanding in size so rapidly with technology and the size of them had grown and grown. The legislation was, requ was requiring the number of boats for what had been much smaller sized vessels and it didn't keep up with that growth. Uh, so the White Star Line had pictured that they were gonna eventually up the requirements, and, but they didn't wanna do anything until that was officially out because then they'd put all these boats in and then find out you need more. Or, but what they did is those davits were built to accommodate more than one row of, of boats on the ship eventually. Now, what is a davit again? Okay, that's the arms when you're looking at the deck where the ropes are attached to the end of the lifeboats and it swings it out over the side of the hull for lowering purposes. Okay. Uh, and really, I think it's almost a misnomer, this whole mm -hmm. argument about lifeboats. That's the most famous thing you think of with the ship is that, oh, it mm -hmm. sank and there wasn't enough room for everybody. But if you look at the reality of the, the sinking, uh, from the time that the ship hit the iceberg until it sank, they did have uh, 16 standard lifeboats. And well, two of those are smaller size ones, but 16 wood hauled ones, and then four what they call collapsible boats, which were for emergencies that they kind of folded down and then could be assembled in an emergency situation and used. So there's a total of 20 boats, far fewer even if they filled them up full to hold everyone. But they didn't start launching the lifeboats. Like, I think the actual order to start putting people in the, the boats was at 12.25 a.m. And the, that was well after, that was like 45 minutes after the collision. Uh, mm -hmm. And when the first boat didn't launch until 12.40, a little bit after 12.40, so you're talking an hour from the collision until the first boat being lowered. People didn't think the ship could sink. They didn't want to go in the boats initially. Right. Then at the end, there was this panic to get into them. <laughs> Big but, rush. But um, really, when the ship actually started going underwater, so the, the deck itself where the passengers were, um, started going underwater, that those four collapsible boats, two of them had just gotten away. Two of them were not even able to be launched properly because they ran out of time. So they floated off and people clung to them. And some small number were able to be saved. but. I strongly believe, based on if they had enough boats for everybody and everything else played out the way it did in reality, other than the boat number, what would have happened is they would have lowered the same amount they actually did in reality, then you would have had X number of boats that were still sitting on the deck that they didn't have time to get to. And maybe they could have cut them loose and it floated off and saved a few more lives, which would have been great. Even one more person would have made mm -hmm. it worthwhile. But I, I really don't think there is any possible way, short of them having some sort of uh, psychic ability to project what was going to happen, <laughs> yeah. that they would have right. been able to get everybody into those boats and save them even with a higher number. 
and the, and yeah. the boats weren't full that were first coming out. There was only mm -hmm. oh. a tiny number of people compared to what the boat's capacity was. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I guess that, that plays to the fact that people really didn't think the ship they was going to sink. They were reluctant to get into the boats. Some of them were. Now, did the captain try to give any orders to come back and pick up people after? Yeah. yeah. Afterward, if, uh, to fill those empty seats? Yeah, absolutely, because uh, one of the things that, and this is uh, something they had planned on doing, a number of officers had mentioned this, and the second officer, Light Toller, um, who was in charge of loading on the port side of the ship, had sent some guys below deck to open up one of the gangway doors on the side of the ship where you'd board when you're in port. And um, the idea was that they were going to have the lifeboats that had been lowered with less people row back to the side of the ship, and people are going to come down ladders or, or rope ladders right. and get in there. And those people disappeared. Nobody knows why. <laughs> they could have gone somewhere else in the ship, or maybe they got overwhelmed by flooding. Who knows? But that plan never came to fruition. So later in the sinking, Captain Smith actually called back several of the boats through a megaphone to come back to the side. And, and for various reasons, the people didn't do that. And uh, that could have saved a number of other people just mm -hmm. from that. But uh, it is kind of a sad thing when you think about it, but it's understandable that people probably panicked and thought the ship was going to suck them under and that things that may not have actually been true from what we know about sinkings now, but that was a common fear that people right. mentioned. Yeah. I read also there was a fear that the, the boats get swamped by people desperately right. trying to yeah, yeah, pull absolutely. themselves into the boat right. as well. Mm -hmm. Well, all this um, panic and everything makes me think of the of the um, of the movies that have been done on the Titanic. And this plays more right. to Marianne because it had a big impact on right. uh, your right. interest in the Titanic. Right. And I'm, I'm just curious about mm -hmm. Hollywood's portrayal versus reality. <laughs> and I'm sure there might be a little bit of a gap between the two, to say the least. But I thought maybe you could both yeah. comment on that. Yeah. Well, I thought Cameron's movie was very well done. And of course, it really was the first film that was made about the Titanic to portray everything so realistically as far as the ship itself and in color. And, you know, he had all the, he had the rooms recreated. He had the grand staircase recreated. The exterior of the ship, I mean, when I remember when I was watching the movie, I was just blown away by how beautiful it was. And it's, you know, it's moving. It's actually like it's right there before you. Of course, he had his fictional characters, Jack and Rose and some others, and they were interplaying with the real people who were on the ship. Um, you know, and his objective, I think, was to tell a story that would get people into the story of the Titanic. And I think that's exactly what happened, because after the movie came out, there was a huge amount of interest and all the societies gained members, and there were books, and there were programs, and I mean, it just, it was Titanic mania <laughs> for, for quite a while there. I think that's, know, that's a great point, though, about how that really reignited interest, and in, mm -hmm. that was the highest level of interest since when they found the wreck. Uh, yeah. And I, I, think, I think that something that goes with that, too, is that a lot of people that are more hardcore historians will say, well, there's... That this was wrong and that was yeah, wrong. Yeah, and, and things that average viewers might not notice and they nitpick, and we all have a tendency if you're into history to do that with historical movies and that. But I think regardless of what somebody feels about the movie, they could have hated it or they could have really loved it. If you're into the history, I think it was a very good thing because just from the standpoint of God, a lot of people are interested in the real history. And James Cameron made so much money off that movie that he was able to fund multiple expeditions yeah, to right. go back and dive and explore the ship. And they found out all types of really interesting things that we didn't know about the way the ship broke up and about rooms inside the ship that are preserved that they right. never filmed before. Uh, so I think on balance, regardless of what somebody thinks about the movie, that was a good thing. I um, guess James yeah. Cameron himself just had a huge passion for the mm -hmm. Titanic. He got hooked. He got hooked <laughs> in a big way, <laughs> bigger than probably anybody, maybe except Robert Ballard. Mm -hmm. You know, I always think there were like these, these watershed events on the Titanic that brought it back into the public eye. And that was, the first one was the, night, the publication of A Night to Remember, the book by Walter Lord. It's a classic. And they, that's the classic that a lot of Titanic buffs cut their teeth on. And then they made a movie of it. And then there was The Discovery of the Wreck in 1985. And that brought a whole lot more interest. And then again, James Cameron's movie. Mm -hmm. And the, the 100th anniversary in 2012. So, well, not having done research myself, it just seemed to mm -hmm. me that the actual sinking of the ship 
seemed very realistic and it captured some of the emotion and the panic oh, yeah. and, uh, and the tragedy of these people who are trapped and right. um, had no place to go and uh, ended up going down with I the I remember ship being the in the theater and uh, the first time seeing the movie and um, the scene where the camera draws back after the ship has gone down and there's all the people in the water and they're screaming and struggling and camera draws back to a big wide shot and the people in the theater were just gasping. Yeah. Literally. And I, I think so, something else like even there's been a number of imitators of that uh -huh. since that time too where they've taken other historical events and then tried to do the same formula that camera did with very mixed success but <laughs> uh, people said well that's going to be a bomb nobody's you know. interested in a, hit, a movie about anything historical and whatever and that and that, they already know how it ended yeah, you know yeah. ship yeah. went down so prove people can be interested in historical topics even if it's dressed with some fictional elements they just, it does draw people in right if it's done well i think yeah. it was brilliant yeah. in the way that he went about it because mm -hmm. without that human story you wouldn't have gotten drawn in yeah like the three of us might have been interested in going to see it but there have been a lot of people that said this is really dry yeah <laughs> they wouldn't have liked it <laughs> was it really a safe on the titanic that, well, there was a safe, there I'm sure. There was a safe. Yeah. Was there anything valuable uh, uh, that was... Did they ever recover it? I well, didn't think... That... You'll, remember, you'll remember this when I bring oh, it up. There, there the... was a, a safe that they had recovered. It was back in the 80s. Uh, oh, it was on TV. Yeah, maybe, right. maybe around 87. It was all... Like, uh, Tully Savalas, I believe, right. Uh, right. narrated it. It was a live event. They raised this safe and then opened it, and there was nothing in it. <laughs> so it's kind of like the Al Capone's vault. <laughs> right, yes. Thing. Uh, <laughs> But I think if people had gone back and looked at the historical record, there's a lot of accounts that passengers had gone back to the purser's office and to get, get their, their belongings. Yeah. Right. Uh, so th even if they had opened it, uh, <laughs> I, there's very little chance there would have been anything right. of interest in there if they had gone back and bothered to do the research I always first. Wondered but, if, yeah. I always wondered if James Cameron was sort of playing on that Telly mm -hmm. Savalas thing when he had the scene where they opened the safe and he's pulling out all this wet currency and there's nothing there and nothing there and the jewels he thought the the necklace he thought was going to be there it wasn't there and then and then he pulls out that leather valise that had Rose's drawings in it but, I, I, <laughs> do, I do recall seeing you may have seen this you know. at the artifact expedition they had uh -huh. last year in uh, in Cleveland but or beginning of this year rather and they had uh, the front of the, one of the safes that they brought up where it had the the nameplate for the company that made it and they, oh, they brought uh -huh. it up and preserved uh -huh. it so I thought that was interesting seeing some of the objects, even if it's something more mundane like that. I thought that was pretty interesting. But what are some of the things that they have recovered from the Titanic that are of interest? I, I, the only one I know of that comes to mind is a circular staircase that somehow they managed to, to bring up from the depths. Is there anything else? That... I don't remember that being one of the items, do you? No, um, yeah, I know there's, there's chunks of the Grand Staircase that it, I think it was probably the aft one from when the ship broke in half that mm. floated up in the vessels that went out and uh, recovered oh. bodies. Also, it was back. recovered um, at the t at the at time, the time of the not sinking. not later yeah. by the expeditions. Oh, okay. uh, but but there's been a lot of interesting artifacts recovered. Um, of course, one was they called it the big piece, which was a big section mm -hmm. of the hull, and they were able to bring that up. And I saw that in some of the exhibitions. You probably did too. Yeah. And uh, there's other things too that, like real personal touch, where they brought up baggage from some of the some of the people survived, right. some died, but there was personal letters that were still preserved because they were kept inside of leather suitcases, and the right. bacteria and organisms couldn't need it. But there is uh, one that a lot of people have cited. Uh, it's was it a uh, Saltfield was his name, the perfume dealer. Oh, the perfume. Yeah. Yes. And, and they he had survived, but he had all these samples of perfumes and things that in a little suitcase like thing yeah and they they brought those up and they still were fragrant and still <laughs> had that I smell. smelled those at the exhibit it was yeah. amazing oh, really? they allowed you to... well they had them in a glass case and they had little holes in the glass and you could you smell yeah. put your nose up there and you could still smell that perfume it was amazing mm -hmm. been mm -hmm. under the water all those years <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so well I think we're coming to the end of our time here um, is there anything mm -hmm. else that you'd like to share about the Titanic, we have a couple more minutes. Uh, any of the last When you were talking thoughts? about things that have been brought up, I was remembering that, and we wrote about this in our book, there was um, a lifeboat davit from, uh, I believe it was Collapsible Sea, mm. uh, that was on display at the Great Lakes Science Center in 20, uh, 2002 when they had the exhibit here. And, and actually that 
the davit that lowered that lifeboat, that was the davit that lowered um, the particular lifeboat that some of the Ohio people actually escaped in. So I always yeah. thought that was pretty interesting. What I, I think too, it's like if people are interested in the topic, not, not just our books, because obviously we'd like people to read those, but I would encourage people that are interested in the history just to, to get as many books out from their library or bookstores or wherever and just read about it. And that's how you get interested. It could be Titanic or any other historical subject. You right. do that reading and mm -hmm. then kind of branch off and start doing your own research. You never know what you're going to find. It could be something that we all don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is quite a bit. but. <laughs> Well, I find it fascinating from what you've told me today is I realize, especially the fact that there hasn't been a, um, a, uh, an incident like the Titanic since, yeah. uh, and because of the Titanic itself happening, has probably saved numerous lives and averted other tragedies that could have been of the same magnitude as the Titanic. So I, I think even though mm -hmm. the Titanic itself was such a tragedy, it has also helped humanity quite a bit in saving a lot of other lives and, uh, since then. Yeah, so, I guess that's the irony of it, huh? Yeah, more irony. It <laughs> Se seems like the only time that there's big changes in safety regulations or Just anything like that. when there's a disaster. Yeah, if there's a plane crash or the space shuttle when it blew up or all these different things, it seems like after the fact that there's things put in place that prevent that from happening and then it's always what you don't know right. causes disasters, not what you know. Mm -hmm, true. Yeah. It sometimes takes a bad event to get people to change their ways. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Marianne and Tad, for uh, coming in today. Um, and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk more about the Titanic sometime in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Welcome.